Great. Good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Louisa Ivers. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Global Health at Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm really delighted to moderate this session this morning, thanks to the MGH Research Institute for hosting it. Global health partnerships can be very fruitful for the advancement of science, but at the same time, there is substantial room for improvement in the way that North American and European academics interface with their academic partners around the world. And academic global health is really interlocked within the structures that were forged by global history. That's the global history of colonialism and racism and neoliberal policies. And as the COVID-19 pandemic has shifted our daily realities and altered the priorities of funding agencies, and in some spaces, especially in Boston, I would say, have consumed our daily work, it's really an opportunity for us to reflect on how this moment is going to impact our, the future of our partnerships and hopefully give us the opportunity to make some advances in improving them. So I'm delighted to welcome three colleagues to discuss the future of global health partnerships in the COVID era. Dr. Jessica Haber is an internist at Massachusetts General Hospital and an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. She has been working in global health and studying adherence to HIV medicine um, for her whole career since the early 2000s. Her research focuses on adherence monitoring and interventions. She works in Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa. She's the director of research at the MGH Center for Global Health, and she has a doctorate in medicine and a master's in science. Dr. Yap Boom is joining us. He is the representative for Africa of Epicentre. That's the research arm of Médecins Sans Frontières. He's the former director of the Epicentre uh, Mbarara Research Center in Uganda, where he is also a professor of medicine. He's led many research activities in areas like malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, HIV <laughs> Ebola virus disease, and he has more than 100 publications. He's currently co-leading the operational research unit of the Ministry of Public Health in Cameroon in the COVID response. And Dr. Boom has an engineering degree, a master's in microbiology, a master's in public health, and a PhD in biology. We're also joined from Dr. Isaivani Nigger. She is the Director of Strategy and Partnerships in the African Academy of Sciences. She was previously the Chief Director of International Resources at the Department of Science and Technology in South Africa. She's a research scientist and has worked on environment and sustainable development and in various policymaking processes in post-apartheid South Africa. She's a PhD in geography that's focused on science policy and a master's of science degree in geology and philosophy of social sciences. So we have a wonderful lineup. If we could just move to the next slide, I'll mention the process, the procedures. So we're going to talk through um, current imbalances and partnerships challenges and opportunities in the COVID era, we envision partnerships and have some questions and answers. I'll ask you to post your questions in the chat. We'll let the speakers go through their presentations and I'll look forward to moderating the questions in the chat. So thank you very much and I'll pass it over to our first speaker. Great, thank you very much for the um, excellent introduction, Louise, and thank you all for joining. Um, I don't know exactly where everyone is coming from, but I think we do have global representation. So that's one of, one of the upsides of the COVID era is that we can have more um, interactions like this. So next slide. So as Luis uh, mentioned, um, there is an imbalance in global health research partnerships. And the next few slides will kind of set the stage for our, our presentation and hopefully a robust discussion um, after, the, after we get through the initial slides. And I think this is probably well known to many, but I think worth um, a few minutes to, to talk about you know, why, uh, what the situation is and why, why it may be that way. And I will be speaking in somewhat of generalizations, uh, but I do think they're informative. And of course there are exceptions, but I think as a general rule, um, the, the global north, meaning primarily the US, um, Europe, um, and Australia, although it's not in the north, tends to drive a lot of the research agendas in global health. Um, a lot of the papers um, come from the global north and the grants um, as well. The global south is obviously involved in global health work, but it tends to be more on the data collection side of things and really not driving the research agenda. 
and we could have a whole webinar just about the, um, the root causes of this imbalance, but I think broadly speaking, uh, they reflect academic um, and economic resources being balanced primarily towards the global north. Next slide, please. So to document some of this imbalance, um, Rose uh, Mbaye uh, Yapu, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, um, and several others, did a systematic review um, looking at uh, nearly 40 years of research on infectious disease coming out of Sub-Saharan Africa um, and published it in Blo uh, BMJ, Global Health, uh, BMJ Global Health a few um, months ago and looking at several different conditions to get a good sense as to what, what exactly does this look like, um, including high priority um, infections like HIV, malaria, and TB, as well as some that are, are less recognized on, a, on the global stage. Um, and these papers were reviewed um, with the criteria of just having um, any kind of laboratory work and being published from Africa. Next slide. So in this um, review, they, um, we all identified nearly 3,000 papers um, and 93% had at least one African author, which is somewhat encouraging, although that means that 200 of them had absolutely zero representation from the country where the data um, were collected. Next, please. Could you press the advanced button, Tierney? But I think what was um, very concerning is that less than 50% of these papers had uh, an African lead, and meaning the first or the senior author position, and less than 10% were supported by African funding. And I think this review very clearly highlights the underrepresentation of African um, scientists in the vast majority of research that is reflecting um, the, uh, the situation in Africa um, as part of global health partnerships. And I think it's also important to note that there's a bias towards Anglophone countries, um, which means we're missing out on many French speaking and, and other uh, languages um, around the globe. Next slide, please. And given this situation, Yap, I, and some other colleagues wrote a paper also in BMJ Global Health, trying to understand you know, what's going on here and what can we do about it more importantly. And we came up with a five-pronged approach to think about changes that we could make that would help improve this imbalance in, in global health research partnerships. And as you can see in the slide, they are involving communication, mentorship, redefining academic currency and priorities, global south development, and investment in the global south. And try to um, recall these areas, um, and in a few minutes, we're going to revisit them and uh, thinking about what are the opportunities now in the COVID era to make some difference here. Because um, there are a number of challenges um, that I think we're all recognizing, but I think challenge also creates opportunity. And we can think about this framework as we envision what the future of our partnerships could be um, now that we are in the COVID era. Next slide, please. So I don't think I need to tell anybody how challenging the current times are uh, with COVID, but just so we're all on the same page, I think we all recognize that travel is not an option, um, certainly not now, but probably for quite some time given quarantine requirements and just uh, the desire to um, stem the spread of COVID. Well, we're no longer having in-person conferences or meetings as represented by our, our discussion today. Um, we have limited ability to, to develop new partnerships in light of the, the, the lack of in-person uh, connection. And while a lot can be done remotely, um, it can be very challenging, especially for junior investigators to really get started when so much of the, the partnership formation tends to happen in person. And similarly, the funding that's required to do all of this work um, is really uh, unclear at this time. Next slide, please. I think um, in light of, of all of these differences in the way that we conduct research and interact with each other, um, the imbalance that we're seeing currently in global health research partnerships may actually worsen. Um, so as Louise indicated at the very beginning of our um, talk today, um, a lot of the priorities um, are, are shifting more um, to what's happening exactly in our backyard. Um, you know, we uh, really need to kind of hunker down and, and focus on the local area, and that may lessen um, our interest in, in having partnerships abroad. 
um, a lot of people are writing more papers and I think that's fantastic because they're not able to initiate new projects. Um, but are those papers being done in a balanced way and are they engaging with all partnerships in an equitable way? Um, that's a, a significant concern. Um, and then also as, the, as money is being shifted into COVID, um, are the priorities that we've been focused on over the years um, that reflect more of a global community, are those potentially in jeopardy? And if so, is that going to limit the ability of the Global South to take leadership, um, especially if uh, the funds that are coming from the Global South to promote their research agenda are being shifted towards COVID in their own environments? Next slide, please. So I'd like to, to think of the glass as being half full and not always worrying about the, the problems, but also thinking about the opportunities that can come um, when we are faced with challenge. And I think, if anything, the, the COVID experience has taught us that we do live in an uh, interconnected world and we cannot isolate and think only about our local circumstances. And now more than ever, I think there's a, a mandate to, to coordinate our activities and to really think globally. And concurrent, as I think we all, all know, concurrent with the COVID um, response, we've also been focusing recently on the structural racism uh, that has been highlighted um, recently by the, the police brutality in the US. But this is not a new problem. This is something that's been around for hundreds of years. Um, but sometimes it takes a crisis uh, to, to make change. And so this may be a very important moment to not only think about these imbalances in the, the research partnerships, but to think about the structural racism um, that contribute to those imbalances and why global health is in many, many places a very white field. Um, why is it that way? And as we think about redefining our partnerships and taking advantage of some of the um, opportunities to make positive change, can we do that in a way that chips away at the structural racism underneath a lot of the imbalances? Next slide. So I think we really need to think globally about redefining our roles. I'll talk in a few minutes um, about those five categories that are much more focused on, on specific research partnerships. But I do think we, we should think broadly about our, our global role. Um, the US uh, with retreat from the WHO uh, recently, I think was, was very disheartening. Um, and it, it, I hope, does not signal um, lack of commitment from the U.S. globally, but I think it does raise the question, and will others be doing the same? Um, hopefully the field will not weaken um, because of the, these types of uh, changes in global roles. But again, I think we need to think about um, where is the leadership coming from and how can we support that in our uh, new era of global health partnerships. Next slide, please. So let's look at the path forward. Next, please. So I'm sure many of you have heard of the expression, um, never waste a good pandemic. <laughs> and that's not something we would have ever thought to say um, a few years ago, but it's certainly something that I think many of us are, are considering now. And as I was saying now, even though it's a crisis in many ways, I think it is a real opportunity uh, to make some change um, and to support the um, more of a move towards a global South uh, driven agenda and research. Next, please. So let's revisit those five categories that I mentioned uh, that Yap, um, my other uh, co-authors and I outlined in our paper um, in uh, BMJ Global Health. So I think with a lens of, of trying to increase the, the leadership um, within the Global South, we can start with some basics uh, just around communication. And I know that sounds very simple, um, but it can sometimes be very difficult, and especially on forums like this where we can't have that in-person uh, connection, it can sometimes be difficult. And I think acknowledging that is very important, um, to acknowledge this is our new normal, and to think about how we can um, have open conversations about these, these issues, which can, can be very um, difficult. It can be quite awkward to talk about this imbalance and what it means. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very important first step and it'll help us identify mechanisms that make sense uh, within each individual partnership so that we can uh, adjust the imbalance uh, at every level uh, within those uh, individual partnerships and then at a larger structural level. The second area is within mentorship. 
Um, and research uh, really is built on a foundation of mentorship. Um, it's how successful researchers learn what to do. Um, and it's part of many institutions, um, but I think it doesn't get the focus it needs in global health in many ways. Um, and I think this is a time when we can focus on the mentorship that is provided uh, to our partners. I'm speaking from, from the perspective of the Global North to, to focus on the careers of our colleagues in the Global South. And now that there may be more time spent on writing or activities that don't involve uh, as much data collection um, as before the, the pandemic, can we shift our focus on mentorship to supporting paper and um, grant writing with our Global South uh, trainees? Um, and also including them in this process. You know, they may have very good ideas about how to re-envision these partnerships, having peer mentoring, um, maybe having forums like this through Zoom where they can learn from each other. And perhaps we haven't had the time or the, the lens uh, to see the value of, of these relationships. Um, but this is part of the opportunity um, of, of this time. Next slide, please. So the third area is in redefining academic currency. And I'm sure everyone on this, um, on this Zoom call is aware that careers grow in research by the number of papers and the number of grants that you have. Um, but they're also within that, that process is, you know, how much time are you spending at your local institution and the value of promoting um, partnership, gen like generally speaking, the, those partnerships doesn't always make it into that academic currency. And there are several people, including um, Bethany Hetgothier uh, here at uh, Harvard, who are working to try and change that so that the institution is promoting this equity and individual researchers don't need to argue for the value of what they're doing, which can be very um, helpful you know, in promoting the, the program development within the Global South. And in thinking directly about um, development, I think uh, Isavani will tell us a lot more about what's going on within the African Academy of Sciences and, and Yap can speak to his efforts uh, for regional development. So I won't say too much here, but I think as Global North partners, we can try to learn from our colleagues um, who are doing work in uh, a regional focus and see what, can, what role can we play to support that development in ways that perhaps we aren't doing now. Next slide, please. And then finally with investment, um, you know, research requires funding. Um, everything is easier with money, of course, and you know, that money has to go somewhere. Um, Typically, it does come to the Global North and then get subcontracted out to the um, partners in global health um, partnerships. Um, but I think we can try to re-envision a, a way for more of that funding to go directly um, to the Global South so that when, where the money is, the priorities can be set. And that's very difficult for us to do as individual uh, researchers, um, but we can develop relationships with our program officers and the, the people who decide where the funding goes. And part of that can be done through conversations, um, part of that can be done um, through opinion pieces. Um, but I think the more we can promote this idea of, of research that funding that goes directly to our partners, the more the agenda will, will shift and we can reach hopefully some tipping points um, in where the priorities are set. Next slide, please. So I will conclude my okay. initial opening comments here and then give the microphone over to Yap and then uh, Isavani will follow and then we can open up the conversation. I'd love to hear your thoughts and reflections on the, um, the stage that, that I hope my in, uh, initial slides have set. Yap, please. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for introducing me just before and, and Louise and for giving me th this opportunity to share a bit um, the way we think the, the, the partnership. You know, from our perspective in, in, in the continent in Africa, we, we see outbreak and pandemics like COVID as a, a huge opportunity to think and to rethink how we can do a certain number of things. So right now in Cameroon, where I'm, I'm, I'm based, we are trying to find different ways of increasing the number of people we can test so that we can get to the standard, uh, like what the WHO is proposing. 
most of the country will use the molecular test and so on. And we know that we don't have those possibilities. So we have to think out of the box. And this is the, the same critical thinking process that I, I'm using right now. Next slide, please. So what we need to build the future of partnership, the future of research, the future of global health, it's definitely to have the, the tool that will make sense for both of us so that we can connect. Uh, Jessica has already mentioned how all these days you are communi communicating through Zoom and all those things, but um, we are thinking about something that is more sustainable, easy to use, a bit like what you see with uh, LinkedIn but, or ResearchGate or even Facebook, but something that is really dedicated to global health and, and to researchers where you can connect people. I've been working with um, Jessica and other people for quite a number of years. I receive interns coming from different parts of the world, but really because we have a connection. So how about having that very flexible, easy to use platform that we can build where you can have researchers, institutions, but also the donors and uh, the philanthropies, and also some seed grants that can help people to build, to connect. Next slide. And while moving toward that, it's critical, I think, to tap on the diaspora. If you look at where you are, you have an African um, Center for Af African Studies. You have quite a significant amount of African people doing research in the US who are in a position to support or at least get involved in what is happening in the continent. It has quite a number of advantages. They have a good understanding of both culture and they can play the role of, let me call it translator. So while thinking about that future, while thinking about the different projects that you, you want to implement in the continent, while thinking about the relationship, think about how we, you can engage more the African diaspora, or let's say the, the diaspora, in implementing, pushing, and helping you, if not to implement, but at least to guide. I mean, that saves a critical amount of time, of energy, and definitely also give them an opportunity for themselves to build something in the continent where they're coming from. Next slide. So, Jessica mentioned the communication, but I really want to highlight communication and partnership. We need to have an open discussion. We need to agree on what are the role and responsibilities of all of us. Are we all involved in conception, data collection, analysis, writing? How do we pair? How do we pair our your student and our student? And when we talk about mentorship, it's definitely a two-way thing. This COVID era, I will have five to six interns, some coming from uh, Stanford, different, univer different university from the US, who will now be involved in what is happening in the continent remotely. I've been having some people coming to Uganda in the past. So just to highlight the mentorship, it's really two ways. While we provide the mentorship of what, and in the know-how that we have in the field, we also accept the mentorship coming from your ends. Most of the time that analysis in all those uh, tools, and, and, and skill that you have. So I think it's critical to agree on what we can do from different ends. And that has to be designed from the beginning. You've seen the article stuck in the middle, we tell the stories. We need to agree from the beginning, how are we going to move? And that open discussion are uh, really the foundation of what we call the collaboration pyramid. That pyramid starts with the confidence. We need to have confidence on each other. If I send a student, I'm from the US, sending a student in Africa, that student or that researchers need to understand and to be as transparent as possible on what he or she is expected to be done. We have seen during the Ebola outbreak all those 
scandals, blood getting out of the countries, being tested in the US without the research, African researcher being involved. So that's, it's a break of trust. So when we've managed to break, to actually implement a real trust between the different parts, that only when we can talk about communication, and when we talk about communication, we move on the top of that pyramid, going toward the comprehension, the understanding. And it's only when we understand each other that we can collaborate. Trust, communication, understanding, and then collaboration. Next slide. So what do we expect? For the researcher, really, what we expect is equity. Equity in building the research agenda. Equity in knowledge acquisition. Equity. In champion. We want to tell our story and to do that together. Now, more important than everything, the community. The community is at the center of all what we are doing. All the solution that we are funding has to improve the quality of life of our community. So we have to make sure that the research we are doing bring homegrown and local solution for our people. And that's the only way we have, we'll have a buy-in. You mentioned that the US is getting out of WHO. We also know that we have less funding, but we have a lot of money in Africa. And this money will be invested in research only if the community has a buy-in. Next slide. And if the community have a buy has a buy-in, then you, as you see in the, in the slide, we'll be moving from an era of equality to equity and liberation. And we will have an opportunity to improve critically the quality of life of our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Boone. Um, okay, let's go ahead, Dr. Neifer. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Jessica, and uh, yeah, for this amazing uh, presentations and Luis for the introduction. Um, so the African Academy of Sciences is an institution that uh, uh, represents the academic uh, research community in Africa, but through a fellowship, it has a, a three-part mandate. We provide funding for programs on the continent. Uh, we recognize excellence where um, the most eminent uh, fellows of the Acad of, uh, in Africa are nominated by their peers to become fellows of the academy, but also uh, take part in think tank and advisory functions. Uh, we are, have our headquarters in Kenya, but we operate across the, uh, the continent. Um, and importantly, our partnerships are very much funded uh, through global partnerships with the North. The majority of our funding comes from the US, uh, UK, uh, uh, and Europe. Uh, at present, and as Yap has just indicated, there is a lot of money in Africa that uh, is spent in, 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 other, in other ways, but unfortunately, uh, at present, not in research. Although most of the countries have committed to spending 1% of their GDP on uh, science, technology, and innovation, uh, research and development, none of those countries uh, in, in Africa are doing this. And so I think, these partnerships with the international community is very important. However, when we're asking for genders, et cetera, to be set, which I think they should be uh, jointly, it's very difficult when the purse strings are being pulled uh, on the one, one side uh, and not, not uh, on the other, there's not sufficient co-funding. These also contribute to this unequal partnership. So I think in the global south, alongside asking our global north partners, to come to the table in uh, developing equity. What we also, uh, I'll mention later through this program, uh, the Coalition for African Research and Innovation is are trying to do is to say to, our, to the African um, philanthropists, governments, uh, and other re uh, research organizations for us to get together in partnership with each other 
um, from Africa, but also within the global south to ensure that we also unlock um, uh, money from, from within uh, the, 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 the global south. Uh, to the next slide, please. Let me just start with my bit. So uh, the focus is on COVID-19. So I just wanted to start with really uh, uh, how the African Academy of Sciences now um, create, uh, becoming involved in this uh, research and development priority setting, which has been created through this urgency of the COVID-19 pandemic. And obviously, um, we, we recognize yeah. that uh, setting the science, technology, and innovation uh, priorities and then investing in them uh, can get the highest return uh, on investment for achieving sustainable development and development objectives on the continent, but elsewhere. So the development agenda and the science and technology innov and innovation agenda and research and development is very much linked. And that's something that I think as the research community broadly uh, in the global south, we haven't co constantly made that linkage to, to within our countries, but also to our, with, with our global partners. And so, as I said to you, we, we, we commit to spending this money, but it usually gets overtaken by other priorities, whether it be infrastructure, now, including uh, during this pandemic uh, in COVID-19, we will be spending a lot of, uh, of our resources, but what is not uh, clear is how money is going to be diverted from very other important priorities that our countries and people face in, uh, on the continent, including uh, HIV, other infectious diseases, and, and non-infectious diseases, including uh, the growth of um, epidemics like diabetes, uh, mental health illnesses, et cetera, on the continent. So this is very uh, important. And um, we have um, you know, a large population, much of them young, and the, 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 the amount of researchers per million habit, inhabitants is very, very high, 198 uh, researchers per million habit, inhabitants. And so our, besides our economic capacity, the human scientific uh, capacity is equally constrained to m m meet this uh, growing demands on, on the continent. So this R&D uh, investment is really important. These global partnerships and investment from the global north in uh, research partnerships uh, with Africa and the rest of the developing world it is really important. Uh, continue. Uh, and so, what, uh, let me just uh, focus on, sorry, on the report. What we did is as soon as the uh, outbreak um, in, in the beginning of March uh, started in Africa, we brought together experts from the academy and our, our partners to discuss what would be the research and development goals for COVID-19 in Africa. So WHO provided this global template, but what, you know, uh, very, very important for us is what was going to be specific in the African context. So we got together these various uh, researchers, we came uh, together, this report is available on our website. We have a COVID-19 page and you can access what are the uh, different priorities. Uh, and very importantly, a focus on social sciences, was also um, elevated there uh, where there's not enough investment on the impacts of measures that are taken to contain the, uh, the epidemic, including uh, the impact of social distancing measures. And so we've been working in partnership with the global, um, with the Pan-African agencies like the African Union Commission, uh, Africa CDC, uh, WHO, Afro, the, the African section of WHO, to, to, to look at some of these. And on our webpage as well is um, a rapid research synthesis that was done around, uh, funded by Global North Partner DFID around the social, uh, the social and economic impacts of um, the social distancing measures. So besides the, 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 health, the health impacts, it's also the, imp the social impacts that we're going to be facing, including an increase in mental, mental health issues going forward uh, that we really need to also start addressing as research priorities. The next slide, please. So, ooh, so I was speaking about this need for us uh, 
in the global south and in Africa and spe specifically to look at uh, how do we get investment from within the continent. And this Coalition for African Research uh, and Innovation, on uh, which uh, YAP is also a member of the advisory board, was established uh, as a sustainability platform for science, technology and innovation on the African continent. And what we want is a well-funded, strongly supported and highly coordinated African STI community but importantly, led by Africans for, to uh, uh, assist us to uh, lead better lives, but are recognizing that our partnerships with the Global North are very important. And there's three pillars to this uh, coalition. One is around resource mobilization, how to catalyze greater investments in, investment, uh, in science, technology, and innovation uh, through uh, look at facilitating further investments through innovative part, uh, approaches, including um, what is now being discussed on the continent, which is an uh, African um, education, science, technology, and, and innovation fund, which the African Development Bank will is looking at developing with harnessing domestic resources on the continent for investment in science, technology, and innovation. Strategic advocacy is very important. How do we make the case to our governments uh, to to invest what they've committed? Uh, at the African Union Summit in Abuja uh, quite a few years ago um, to invest uh, this money to ensure that we have the scientific capacity within the continent that's required for us to achieve uh, you know, better lives for, for, for uh, African people. Systematic collaboration, there's various organizations that fund, conduct, and engage in research in, in Africa. And I think this is what we're talking about here is the, we have these partnerships, but how do we collaborate uh, more systematically to ensure that we achieve shared outcomes? And work in uh, conjunction with these multiple stakeholders uh, to coordinate uh, and connect STI initiatives. I already saw there was one about how does the diaspora get involved in, in in the chat, a question about how does the diaspora get involved in the chat? And I think it's very much through understanding what you can uh, do. And I think uh, people are, have been initiating initiat uh, you know, initiatives from with outside of Africa and the diaspora, including something um, in, in uh, the UK through one of our fellows, uh, Prof. Tumani Kora, which is the African Research Excellence Fund, which he runs by coordinating funding from within the UK, also harnessing support from researchers within, uh, you know, the, the, the diaspora living in the UK to support um, development of uh, researchers, mentorship of researchers, assisting people to understand how to run, uh, write funding proposals. And I think these kinds of initiatives, uh, alongside the work that we're doing as an African Academy of Science, is really important. The next slide, please. So I, I wanted, to, since we're speaking about this, I think uh, Yap spoke about it very eloquently in terms of what are these, uh, what is these, this equity and partnerships that we're seeking about. And I, I wanted to refer to uh, a, a collaborative that we are part of in building this kind of partnerships uh, for, of equals. Uh, on the continent, we are seen as, a, we are an, actually a funder. Um, where we, we deploy a lot of funding, for example, through the Welcome Trust uh, Developing Excellence in Leadership and Training Program uh, on the African con continent. And so building this equity in partnerships is very much uh, part of what we do and or what we're trying to advocate for with our global partners. It's not an easy discussion uh, because I think um, on, on many levels, Jessica referred to, I think the colonial legacy, uh, also, who pulls the purse strings has uh, the power, the power relations lie in the people that have the money. Um, and also, I feel that w even within the continent, sometimes it's very difficult for people to step up when they feel they're not supported from within their country. They're scared of losing the funding. So they will uh, be part of partnerships that are, uh, to them, very clearly uh, not built on, on equity. But so it's also learn teaching the researchers on the continent to speak up in those in those uh, in those relationships to 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 present what they value they're bringing to the to the partnership 
and how they should be recognized. So it's around inclusive and gender setting uh, and funding um, new questions. Uh, and I think I mean, we, we, we know the importance of working with governments, funders, and research and communities in uh, low and uh, middle income countries to develop the research programs that meet their needs. Very importantly, because often you have people coming in with predetermined agendas that don't speak to the context specific needs of that uh, country uh, or the continent. Uh, also, the realities of uh, the, 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 the settings in which, in they, which they work, and it's important for, to, in, to include all of these actors in the gender setting. Then you need to look at funding new types of research questions and valuing different types of skills and knowledge, including uh, in our context, the, 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 the indigenous knowledge systems uh, and other knowledge systems. So um, the, these are new questions that, and looking at complementary competencies are more likely to lead to more mutual benefits to all. And then also in, in including them in the agenda setting, the funders can value the contribution that each brings to uh, the, the table and which might not be money, but could be the knowledge of the context and the experience of working in that context in which knowledge exists that you require in other settings, for example, within our uh, human uh, genetics and uh, her human hereditary and health program, H3 Africa, the human, uh, the African human genome has not been sequenced, uh, and we really need to. Uh, and we've been involved uh, with with our partners in undertaking this uh, program to to get the uh, African human genome sequenced. And in terms of um, health benefits. Uh, developing drugs that uh, can can uh, specific to the different types of genetic makes up uh, uh, of African communities, but very importantly, since we are uh, the um, cradle of humankind, understanding the genetic makeup of the African uh, population is really really important uh, in developing these drugs, vaccines, etc. Uh, the fourth point is around rewarding. Uh, the project managers, not just the researchers and the team players, and managing these diverse teams that are culturally sensitive yet rigorous and impactful, looking at equality beyond leaders, for, uh, but also for the wider group engaged within the research, including the non academic partners, the communities from which uh, information is being um, uh, harvested, the students, technicians. Uh, contractors that are involved and ensuring that there's diverse types of institutions, including in, in Africa, not just academics. Some of the great uh, research is done through civil society organizations. You'll find great academic uh, knowledge uh, and uh, individuals within those research, uh, uh, those non academic institutions. How do we include their perspectives within the research agenda? And uh, this is an important factor in success, successful collaborative institute, uh, initiatives. Then there's also around equity around budgets, that if you want equal partnerships, you really need to be given uh, ac adequate resources to the uh, partners in Africa and the Global South, uh, and also uh, adequate financial management training and support. Uh, in this regard, we have currently um, uh, a call that's open through the African Academy of Sciences for research management professionals in Africa, uh, working collaboration with those in the UK because this is funded through a UK partnership in uh, international research management staff development, which is opened uh, on the 9th and closes um, clo open on the 19th of May. Uh, and th this is also where we recognize that building this capacity of research institutions is important, providing uh, ongoing in institutional strengthening uh, to these institutions uh, and research organization to support and manage international research projects and play a major role in making them successful, widening participation, supporting research partnerships beyond the usual people that you know, and I think this is going to be very important during this uh, this this era as well. I think it's through these in-person meetings that we are able to expand our networks. How are we going to do this going forward if we are not going to be uh, attending conferences and meeting those really important 
people in the corridors and getting to know what work they're doing. And then that's a way a lot of partnerships have been developed. Investing for the long term, a lot of these projects are two to three year projects, but a lot of these issues are very long term issues. And how do we develop uh, support for them into the long term? And more working closely with other funders and agencies between the North and South and understanding how uh, we undertake work in our different contexts, learning from each other, because it could be beneficial also into how in the North you include, be more, more inclusive of, of uh, community inputs, et cetera. Um, and the next slide. I wanted to end by just giving you an overview of one of the platform that we've developed at the African Academy of Science, which is called the Alliance for Accelerating Science in Africa. And, and this is our business plan of an or strategic plan which is looking at what in terms of shifting the center of gravity for African science because we know we, a, a lot of the funding comes from the north sometimes the, the agenda is set there but what we are saying is that we need to on the continent build a vibrant research culture and leadership development over the long term through this first goal which was to build the R&D leadership and uh, environments through these various program one is through this program uh, the research management program in Africa, REMPRO Africa. The other, we have um, hu a huge amount of fellowship programs where we're developing young, uh, early career researchers to undertake research on the continent. This includes a partnership with the NIH through the APTI fellowships, uh, uh, through the NIH and the Gates Foundation, a partnership with the UK Royal Society, and various other partners where. Firstly, it gives the opportunity for researchers to go uh, to, to work with the research managers and researchers in the global north, but then very importantly, also supports them when they come back to work within their research labs to, to mentor other research professionals. Uh, provide uh, the, the second goal is around innovation and a, a science driven entrepreneurial culture to support, support that. Thus, we have a Grand Challenges Africa program which supports a lot of the research that's coming, uh, the innovation that comes out of research to take them to the next stage, to develop viable products and uh, or pilot pro programs. And then also uh, more recently in the last two years, a translation to scale program to take those uh, innovation into the market. Uh, the identifying and supporting rising research leaders, uh, supporting those uh, researchers who are in, on the continent to build their careers in Africa. And then importantly, targeting those critical gaps in the research landscape that need to be addressed, both in the agenda setting from uh, what needs to be addressed on the research and development agenda, but also in terms of the institutional landscape and what support uh, is needed on the African con continent in order to build a robust uh, research ecosystem that allows us to develop these equal partnerships. Because I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that until you have this uh, equality also in the um, research institutions and support here, it's very difficult for researchers to do the high quality research that's required on the continent uh, that our, our partners on the global north do. And that, 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 that leads to a global bane group brain drain from Africa when people realize they've reached a peak in their career and in order for them to continue, they need to go to the north. What we need to do is besides, um, you know, ensuring that we work with the global parties effectively, ensuring that we build the research ecosystem in Africa. I think that was my last slide. Um, yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, those were um, really outstanding presentations. Thanks to the um, to the three of you. Maybe I could ask uh, Yap and Jessica to go ahead and put your videos back on if you're not on. Um, let me. I think I would just like to say that I really appreciate the honesty with which we've been having this conversation. And I think, as you said, Isabani, it's not an easy discussion. But we, especially in the global north, we have to make it normalize the discussion about equity because if we don't do that i think we're not you know doing a good service to the partnerships so especially for those of us who see the inequities and who want to change them we have to often take the first step i think in, in normalizing it in all of our 
um, groups in our reviews of papers, in our reviews of scientific abstracts. We have to normalize the issues of equity and talk about the history that's forged the path that got us to where we're at. And we can't change history, but we can create a better future. So I think it behooves all of us to just be honest and try to do the best things we can do. I, I want to just, we have a few minutes for discussion and there's a couple of comments in the, um, in the chat. One is about mentorship. And what I see, I moved to the US from Ireland and I saw when I came to the US how the structure of mentorship around science is part of, is one component of really helping to build a successful career. So I was wondering if each of the three of you could talk a little about, and maybe Yap, we can start with you, just talk a little bit, bit about your experience in mentorship, um, how you think that can you know, help contribute to equity and help us, especially in this um, kind of COVID era. If you're... Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, mentorship has definitely be um, a two-way thing since the beginning. And while talking about it, um, thinking about David, David Bansberg, with whom we, we started working a long time ago in, in Uganda. And the way we start our relationship was actually because we're figuring out that MGH were, was relying on two or three people who were handling most of the research in, in, in Barara, Uganda, where we were working. And then we had a conversation and then we said that that's abnormal. We need to be in the position where you have 10, 20 young researchers. And to achieve that, the idea was to start nurturing them, pairing them, and giving them the opportunity to leave Uganda, go to the U.S., as it has happened with, with some of them, get the culture, come back, so that they will get a bit of both. I think uh, Jessica can, can take, talk later about uh, some of the, the success. I don't know all, all the names, but there are quite a number of them who we have managed to mentor, now I'm talking about Ugandan, I'm talking about African, who have been mentored. They've been, uh, they, they grant some uh, funding like uh, the, the, the Fogarty uh, and so forth and so on. And now some of them are actually leading the global health in, in, in Uganda. And I think that's definitely something critical. We start with a respect. That investment, the basis was the respect. That's what I would say for now. Great, thanks. Jessica, can you comment? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Yap. I, I think going back to the experience um, that, that David um, initiated for us, um, you know, I, mentorship is, I, I just feel, it, again, it's so fundamental to research and I get so much out of mentoring and, and learn so much from my mentees and just um, really can't imagine being a successful researcher without that kind of relationship. And if we can have more of those kinds of partnerships between the global north and the global south, I think it really is, is an incredible springboard for all of the change that we're talking about. And what you were, I think, alluding to with um, some of my Fogarty mentees. Um, so Fogarty, for those of you who don't know, is a part of the NIH. It's a very small center, but it's focused on grants that go to uh, countries outside of the US. Um, and I think it's been very instrumental in a lot of, of partnership development. And it's, it's um, not the only place to go, but it's one that we, we go to often for, for funding. Um, I think Isavani and, and Louise may have mentioned the Wellcome Trust in the UK. There are many others. And um, the paper that I refer, referenced earlier that uh, Yap um, is the first author on <clears throat> has a list of some of these if you're interested in seeing more of these programs, but the, the um, two mentees that I work with in Uganda have these five-year development awards. And it's a, the exact same investment that I received um, to become a, a successful researcher, <coughs> excuse me. And it's really been incredible to see the growth that comes from that, um, that personalized investment, not just from, from my time as a mentor, but from the funding and the responsibility and the leadership uh, that has enabled um, the, the two individuals I'm referring to, uh, Andrew Mujajira in Kampala and Angela Musimenta in, in Embrara. And each one of them have been able to, to get their own grants subsequent to um, getting this career development award, um, getting independent funding, taking on their own mentees, 
um, really driving the agenda, becoming leaders within their institutions in ways that I think are, you know, it takes time, it takes many years. Um, David used to always say research is, is a, a marathon, it's certainly not a sprint. But this kind of concrete relationship that each one of us can take on when we do our research can just blossom over the years. Um, and when, when people are empowered, when they're funded, um, when they're supported, um, the, all of these, uh, these mandates that we're trying to, to promote about uh, locally driven research for, for locally relevant problems um, that can be done in partnership really, I think, can grow from, from these types of mentoring relationships. And I, I really found it to be one of the most enjoyable aspects of doing global health. And I think most of us get into global health because we care. You know, we care about these, these health problems. <clears throat> we care about the people they affect and we care about our colleagues. And I think the, the, these imbalances that we've been talking about may not always be apparent to people when they first start doing global health research. Um, I think they come to it with, I certainly came to it with wanting to make a difference. Um, but I've learned over the years that one of the most important places to make a difference is with, with those individual relationships in building equitable partnerships. And as, as you are able to in your careers, I know people are at different stages, but as you're able to have those mentoring relationships, I think it's just absolutely fundamentally critical to the, the messages we're talking about today. And that can be done at the peer level or it can be done in a more traditional mentor-mentee way. Savani, I don't know if you would like to add to that as well. Yeah, Savani, let me ask you also just to comment, particularly like in the U.S., we can actually find some resources to protect our time sometimes to be a mentor. Is, can you, in, in addition to just commenting on the need for mentorship, is there any way that the African Academy of Sciences is thinking about support to mentors or investment in mentors so that they can be good mentors? Yeah. So just to start off on the, 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 the importance of mentorship, it's, I think what Jessica just said is really, really important. It's those personal relationships. I mean, from my own experience, I wouldn't have actually even continued beyond my uh, bachelor degree if it wasn't for the support of a very strong mentor who unfortunately passed away this past month, uh, last month, Professor Martin DeWitt. And I think one thing that I could say about the North and the South, he importantly came from the US, from Columbia University, for, uh, and I was working with, with, within a company. And he met me and he just said, but why aren't you continuing studying? And I said, because I couldn't handle, firstly, the sexism and the racism within the academy in South Africa. But I realized it's a global problem. Uh, at, the pro at that time, I hadn't traveled, so I didn't realize it was a global problem. Uh, well, I had traveled, but not uh, for work. But, and then he said, well, actually, no, that shouldn't be a reason you stop. I will be there and support you, both in terms of raising, and I said, well, I don't have funding. He says, don't worry, but if you, if you are interested, just make your way to Cape Town. And he didn't say anything else, and I did. I, I just pitched up, and he basically, the funding was there, and most importantly, the support to take on some of those battles that you have to face within the, and I think mentorship goes beyond just the research work because i think a lot of researchers from the global south face a myriad of challenges and now uh, when when i was involved in, in the you know in the research in teaching here mentorship uh, but also my colleagues were my friends were still involved it's not just about their research projects it's about the challenges they're facing on whether it be gender-based violence, finding someone a safe place, it's it's really important that mentorship in uh, mentors see that as a, a much bigger support that you give to the individual within research context, more broadly, but specifically in South Africa, uh, specifically in Africa, because of the myriad challenges people face, including just getting to uh, classes sometimes. Uh, <laughs> In terms of um, uh, the, what you asked, uh, Louise, yes, we do. We have a mentorship program. So what we, I told you about what we have, we recognize excellence through these eminent fellows, fellows who are part of the academy. And these are the, the, you know, the people that have achieved who are at the top of their game, heading universities, research teams, et cetera, uh, also leaders within government. But we recognize that we, and then we were supporting early career researchers, but we weren't supporting that middle, the people that would become the next fellows. People don't go from early career researchers to becoming a fellow. They are in research positions, uh, 
you know, they tra you know, lecturers, junior lecturers, senior lecturers within, uh, within the institution. So now we have an affiliates program. So alongside the fellowship program and the affiliates program and a very strong connect, uh, pillar of, of that uh, fellowship, uh, affiliates program is saying to the uh, training the fellows to become mentors to the affiliates. So it's so basically then supporting them in their career journey and how they can achieve eminence so that we have a mentorship program uh, at the African Academy of Sciences, the ASF mentorship program. Thank you so much for that. I fear we're out of time. It's a minute past 10 here in Boston, but this has been a really outstanding conversation. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, I think we need to continue this conversation. We welcome to do that with you, uh, Dr. Niker and Dr. Boom. And uh, we certainly will continue doing it at the Center for Global Health and at MGH. So we'll make the recording available for everyone. Uh, look forward to continuing the discussions in a different place and time. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.